Can everybody you hear me off the bat? Wave your hand. Alright, thank you. Alright, we're gonna we're gonna start. I know that there is uh, a lot of uh, folks still in line for food. I'm sorry to do this to you, but um, the way we do this luncheon, at least not to be married to the way we've always done it, but we do have lightning presentations, so that's ten minutes, whoops, ten minutes, ten slides or less. So we're going to power through this and um, try to make your lunch be really valuable and try to take some, get some takeaways from this um, this hour that we have together. Um, so just to set some, um, well, set the stage, my name is Kenji Haratunian. I've been in this uh, industry, the greater outdoor industry, for uh, 33 years now, starting at Adventure 16, which sadly has closed its doors after 57 years now. Uh, down in Los Angeles, where I live and work. Um, I have been a guide and outfitter. I've been uh, the show director of the Outdoor Retailer Show. I do events uh, like Outdoor Media Summit and Outdoor Press Camp and other events in the industry, including Climb Smart and Joshua Tree. And so I um, have been putting, helping to put this together for, uh, well, I think it's about 10 years now. And so we try to do this every OR show so that we gather the voices and the interest of inclusion in the industry and we can come together and uh, network a bit and also hear some stories about kind of the best practices of what's been happening in and around the industry. So that's how we've done it. We've had some different formats over the years and I just thought this picture was pretty interesting because this is from maybe five years ago and there's 24 people in this picture and uh, hands up if you're in this room and you're in that picture. Uh-huh. See? And so if you're questioning of whether uh, you know this movement is a movement or what's going on, or we've been moving. So, so thanks for coming and um, thanks for making the time. Uh, let's see. I'm going to check my notes real quick. Hey, so one thing we haven't done before is to... Um, See who's here, like where are we coming from, what sectors of the industry, what is the industry, and I thought it'd be fun to just take a minute to say, how many people are here, like look, if you're wearing your badge, uh, how many people are here from the nonprofit world? Uh-huh. And how many people are here who are retailers? And how many people are here who are brands? And now I'm checking my notes. How many people are here who are media? And uh, anything other? <laughs> Great. All right, thanks for that. That was actually really instructive. Um, and I think it's especially exciting for me to see retailers and brands in the mix. Um, that was, wasn't much the case early on, and I think uh, we've been able to uh, attract more uh, activity there and also uh, showcase that during this event so so thank you all for coming um of course there are sponsors who help us put this on when i say us there's kind of a small group of founders here people like brad and james um and Devaki, who's not here but um those, those are the people that thought this was a good idea and we should start to kind of beat the drum when we were back in salt lake and um but also, people who are helping this happen at this scale uh, are far beyond you know, my personal budget. So I really want to thank uh, some of you who have been here from the very early beginning of this. Camber, uh, Camber Outdoors uh, is here, and they've been with us from the beginning. Um, uh, as well, REI, who's stepped up to sponsor this event, and Plus Plus, because they provided some last-minute AV support where I was uh, struggling a bit. So thank you. REI and uh, BF Corp, who's also been with us for some time now. Uh, so thanks to Reggie, and you'll hear we'll hear from Joe and some of their team later on. Um, and OutdoorIndustryJobs.com. So one of the very first, 14 years ago, Laurel started OutdoorIndustryJobs.com, a female-owned company in this industry that helps. It's a it's a self-serve job board. So if there's job interest or you just want to see what's happening in the different sectors. They, she does it also for bike and in other segments of the market, I believe hunt and fish maybe, but take a look at OutdoorIndustryJobs.com, a very important resource. And then um, uh, lastly, a, a newer organization called Respect Outside. So we're going to hear from Jim and Gina um, later on this, this lunchtime. So 
that's the sponsor lineup this time. Thank you so much. And also some of the past folks that have really helped build this up into uh, a much bigger event and the biggest uh, gathering at the trade show around inclusion for sure. Um, so let's see. Um, real quick, I thought it would be important before we start the lightning presentations. I feel like a lot of questions are coming at me about, well, what is, what is what, who are you? What do you do? Like, what, who do you work for? What's your company? And I came in here to the Denver Athletic Club. Um, so I just thought, let me just say that um, I, having been the show director of Outdoor Retailer, having had that um, you know, part of my career arc uh, give me that opportunity, has exposed me to a very large network of folks. And so I've been focused since I left OR in 2015 to uh, produce and help strategize events that bring important communities together in the outdoor industry. So, um, you know, media gatherings, um, climbers down in Joshua Tree, um, groups at the trade show around different um, issues that are arising, you know, Zika some years ago. So I, I try to focus on really specific groups, um, but I've always recognized as the show director of OR, the only way that I win as a brand leader is if the whole industry grows. It doesn't help me if Marmot takes market share from Sierra Designs or if uh, you know Life Straw does better and um, First Need does not as, you know does less well. It only helps if the whole thing grows. And so, how are we going to do that? Well, part of it is how asking asking the question: How can we be more relevant to a broader community? And that's what this is about. So. Um, that's what I do. I'm passionate about inclusion. I've had a long history, including work with Outward Bound. Um, I'm married to a woman who uh, worked in um, affirmative action at UCLA for 15 years. And um, in my time with Nielsen, who owned the trade show during my years as the director, they had a very robust um, inclusion program that was, um, I feel like, cutting edge. And in fact, if you look and see who are the diverse companies or the most diverse recognized companies in America, Nielsen is in the top 20 now. So um, there's some good good background there, good uh, experience outside of the industry to, to bring in, I feel. Um, but I think that hearing from the broader group inside the industry about what's happening is helpful in the sense of uh, spurring ideas and tactical things that can be done at small company, small organization, all the way up to the largest that um, we have. So. That's who I am in a nutshell, um, and uh, let's see, I think we can move on, and um, I'd like to start the lightning uh, presentations with uh, Emily Newman. Emily is the uh, new executive director of Camber Outdoors. She comes to us from outside the industry, so I think she might have a really interesting story for us and uh, something to inspire us to um, look around and see what's out there that we can emulate and bring into the outdoor industry. So, Emily, you ready? Thank you so much, Kenji. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being so welcoming. Um, my name is Emily Newman. The pronouns I use are she, her, hers, and I'm the new executive director for Camera Outdoors. Um, Kenji asked me to come and introduce myself. I'm, I'm really pleased to say that I've had a chance to get to meet many of you um, in the last few days um, and just excited to be here. Um, I do come from outside of the industry, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have spent my whole career um, focused on workplace and workplace inclusion um, and how do you um, how you build workplaces and how do you support um, removal of barriers to workplaces and workplace inclusion. Um, I began my career with an organization in Southern California that got um, a fair bit of national recognition because we, um, we achieved a 93% success rate with helping persistently homeless individuals to um, build the skills of getting and keeping their own jobs. Um, and then we built a very large uh, social enterprise, a six and a half million dollar social enterprise um, to support apprenticeships in that space to continue that um, that pipeline forward. I then spent a number of years as a consultant. I helped around the, um, I'm going to date myself, but when, when the Staples Center was launched, there was a, um, a uh, concerted effort from the investors in the Staples Center not to um, re-experience 
for the community the um, what had happened with Dodger Stadium many years ago, which effectively decimated an entire community in Los Angeles. Um, so I worked together with the philanthropic arm of one of the investors to be very intentional around inclusion in the sort of economic boost that comes um, in many different forms, whether that's in forms tied to entrepreneurship, whether that's in form tied to um, pipeline and to specific jobs at the, at the Staples Center and so forth. Um, but really thinking about how do you uh, support communities in that workplace engagement um, and remove those barriers. Um, later on, I did a little bit of work with uh, the former White House with the former president's My Brother's Keeper program, helping to export that program to um, being an evergreen program with the Obama Foundation. And I spent some time um, working inside of um, technology companies and helped to develop a technology to eliminate bias in the hiring process. Um, so always around workplace, I'm passionate about um, and aspirational about what workplaces can look like. Um, and it's actually what drew me um, into this position. I think that, um, as Kenji mentioned, as I'm not of the outdoors, I've been so glad and grateful to be welcome to the outdoors. Um, I do have a, um, I would say, a late, late coming passion for the outdoors um, that really stemmed from, I am a parent of a child who struggled with specific motor coordination challenges as a kid, and um, and so we went outside, and, um, and I'm super proud to say that, that for my child, um, being outside was very healing, and I'm also very passionate about access in that regard because I recognize that that kind of access, hiking, scrambling, looking at mountains, using your, um, my son when he was two, uh, ran headfirst into our kitchen island every day, and we knew there was a challenge. <laughs> so um, we moved to Colorado, and he is now a slack liner. And um, all because of the outdoors. So, um, so I'm personally passionate about the sort of healing power of the environment and making sure that um, that that access is available for all all parents, particularly. Um, so, so Camber, just a little bit, and I, you mentioned sort of the we've been with you for some time. Um, Camber really needed to take a look this last year. What does that really mean? To be with people and to be shoulder to shoulder in in specifically in workplace, but but among a group of um, peers and leaders who are um, doing that work. And so, so so when I joined Camber, we looked very deeply at how our programs, with the help of um, you know some wonderful board members and my extraordinary team who are in the back. Um, really digging in on what are those best practices in workplaces because this industry is not the only industry that is struggling to in a um, you know sort of fully employed and competitive marketplace make sure that um, that instead of moving to um, you know moving to technology we're really opening that um, that space for inclusion in in access to jobs and retention to jobs and so forth. So, um, so we will be focused on a few things this year, and I'm really proud and thankful. I know I saw Teresa out there um, for co-hosting the collaborative roundtable with me the other day. We um, extended invitations, and we will continue to extend invitations um, to leaders in the nonprofit space to just make sure that we are Connecting, but also thinking about how do we move to action? And for me, that was really the place that Camber needed to go. How do we support our corporate partners in moving to action? So, um, so there are a lot of, for example, there are a lot of um, statements uh, out there, but really what are you going to do to move forward in achieving this work? And how do we bring everyone to the table um, in that effort to achieve this work? So we begin with inclusion in the workplace and talking about inclusion because everyone has a role in creating an inclusive workplace. And um, you will see us activated here um, around that, that role with our Camber Story Bus. It's the big yellow bus outside. If you haven't had a chance to stop by either our Story Bus, we have a few stories I know have already been told in here, 
um, or our story booths that are inside. You can just walk up and um, sort of Superman style, maybe Superwoman style, super anyone style. <laughs> um, you can hop in there and, um, and tell your story. And there are prompts, so you don't have to um, be an experienced journalist and know exactly how to sort of move through. We've got good questions in there. Um, we'll also be bringing some um, excellent experience and, and talent from outside of the sector to talk about workplace and what's happening from a global perspective and workplaces. So I hope you'll all join us at our breakfast tomorrow. Um, and, um, and then our, you know, our programs this year um, are centered around specific workplace learning themes so that we are, um, are laser focused on helping our corporate partners to, um, to have those tools and resources to move forward in building their workplaces of choice. I really believe that the flywheel, you know, we are a, um, a strong force at nine, but um, nine, nine team members at Camber, but that flywheel does not move until corporations move. And we see that already with excellence with groups like VF who are, um, who are really leading forward in this work. And we want to encourage all of the corporations in this space to be doing that, to be leading forward, to be leaning on those promising practices um, to build those workplaces. So you can find us tomorrow at breakfast. Um, you can also find out more on our website. We'll be hosting um, and bringing in and engaging um, folks in this room, folks from outside of the industry to lead our webinars so that we've got um, some some excellent education for our corporate partners um, and really getting together and being thoughtful and intentional around how we stand shoulder to shoulder in this work because we are but one organization and we are working on one piece of this. We look forward to working with all of you. And uh, just to bring attention to a few things that I missed during housekeeping, we have our first non-human attendee of the luncheon. So. Greetings, Bilski the dog. Hi, Bilski. Um, also, I wanted to recognize uh, a sponsor I forgot, Outdoor Media Summit, which uh, Yoon Kim, who helped us get this space, um, is is the uh, CEO of. So Yoon's here over in the corner, also one of the early founders of this event. So Yoon is part of the circle of uh, creative creativity here. So Outdoor Media Summit is an event that happens in Estes Park here in Colorado this April, and it kind of moves around each year and gathers the, the leading media minds of the outdoor industry. Um, also, I wanted to recognize Eric, Eric Steele. Eric is a longtime friend, someone that I've worked with uh, for since my days of outdoor retailer. He is the one who's set up the audio, um, audio piece of this here. We're recording it through using his system um, to for posterity's sake, and if you see other versions of the inclusivity luncheon from past, it's probably Eric's work. So uh, his outfit is called Steel Media. He's based here in Colorado as well. All right, so uh, up next is um, a new organization, and I'm ex excited to offer this up. This isn't really something we've addressed here with the luncheon ever in the past 10 years, yet it's an integral part of, of the DEI and inclusivity uh, equation. And so I thought it was great timing and really important. My friend Jim Miller, who I've known for a long time from the paddle sports world, kind of a legendary guy there, working with different brands, um, and yes, and launching his own company was uh, was was someone that I've um, followed for a while. And then he reached out recently uh, with their new organization called Respect Outside. And so um, we're going to have them come up and tell us what Respect Outside is about. Um, his uh, partner, Gina McLeod, is, um, is, is who's going to speak, and she'll tell you a little bit more about herself and why this work is important, what it is, and why it's important to DEI Outdoors. So, Gina, come on up. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kenji, for hosting us today, and we are really honored to be included in this long-standing inclusivity luncheon. It's great to see everybody here. Thank you, your commitment and forward thinking continue to benefit all of us in the outdoor industry. 
Thank you. It's really heartfelt. Um, how many of you in this room have experienced, witnessed, or heard of sexual harassment in your workplace? Yeah, unfortunately, that's what we see everywhere we go. It's endemic. Um, I'm Gina McClard, and I'm the co-founder of Respect Outside. I'm a cisgender, bisexual attorney who's been working for the past 25 years to improve the criminal and civil justice systems for survivors of sexual assault and sexual harassment. The company, Respect Outside, helps provide sexual assault, sexual harassment prevention consulting and trainings exclusively for businesses in the outdoor space. My partner, Jim Miller, who I'm going to make stand up so y'all see him. And I have enjoyed long careers dedicated to both the outdoor industry and human rights, respectively. Ever since Me Too, we've been hearing more and more people come forward to tell their stories. Collectively, we applaud their bravery. We also recognize that some companies are beginning to adapt their workplaces to respond and to be more open to sexual harassment discrimination in a good way. That may have come out the wrong way. <laughs> There's a lot of good things that have come out with Me Too and the repercussions, and, but there's also been some backlash, as you can expect. So let's start with the positive things about Me Too. In 2019, over 300 legislators from 40 states and the District of Columbia have come forward and dedicated their support for strengthening protections against sexual harassment. 20 states by 2020 commonly known as the 20 by 2020 harassment pledge. In 2019 alone, state legislators introduced over 200 bills with exactly those same goals. Most victims of sexual harassment need time to muster the courage and navigate their way to report sexual harassment. Time is essential in these cases, and several states have given victims more time. Connecticut, Maryland, New York, and Oregon extended their statute of limitations or the time in which you can file a workplace claim of discrimination and, of course, in sexual harassment. And I'm proud to say that the superstar here is my home state of Oregon, which has extended that time period to five years. Oregon. There's also a lot of work being done and laws being passed about mandatory anti-sexual harassment training. A whooping nine states have now required companies to provide anti-harassment training. Big states like New York and California and smaller states like Delaware and Vermont. But here, Connecticut's the rock star because Connecticut now requires that all companies that have at least three employees to require yearly sexual harassment training. And I want to make a note here that what I'm seeing in some of the larger, more liberal-leaning states is that a lot of this legislation is coming out of Me Too and is directed directly towards sexual harassment. But we're seeing big moving states like New York now amending that those laws they passed in 2018 to 2019 where they're also broadening it to include all discrimination. Non-disclosure agreements or NDAs have been the bane of existence for a sexual harassment survivor. Company imposed NDAs have silenced victims of sexual harassment and empowered employers to hide their ongoing systemic harassment. But 13 states, from Tennessee to Washington, now limit or altogether prohibit the use of NDAs at, for, on a condition of employment, so when you first start in work, or when there's a settlement case for discrimination 
for sexual harassment. So this is big, real progress. When businesses formally address sexual misconduct, we make powerful strides in creating civility in the workplace. And this is exactly what we need, civility. We become open to a larger discussion about how to cohesively create action in the workplace. And echoing what Emily said, it's great to have a slogan and to say good things, but it must be followed by action. But there's a downside to Me Too, like there's a downside to almost anything. So there's been a backlash, and there is a storm brewing at the Supreme Court that I wanted to tell you with. So bear with me, lawyer. I'm full of legalese and So privileged men are pushing back and creating their own rules to stifle the conversation and turn back the clock on equity. This is known as the Pence effect because Mike Pence famously refuses to dine with any woman other than his wife. We're seeing men retreat and use the fear of making a misstep to strip opportunities for women to be included, mentored, and ultimately to rise to positions of power within their organizations. But the Pence effect extends beyond sex discrimination. People in the workforce are afraid of making mistakes. How many of you have heard, things have gotten so politically correct, I don't even know what to say anymore. Maybe I'll just shut up. No one wants to be called out for making an offensive colleague comment to a colleague who's a person of color, or for using the wrong pronouns with their non-binary coworker. But this fear of interacting, this fear of engaging, has really resulted in this minimizing of contact, the isolation of the other, and creating fewer opportunities for people to advance and to take their rightful leadership opportunities. Now, one solution for this reactionary workplace effect is to require organizations to conduct implicit bias training. Another one would be for organizations to formally sponsor mentorship and sponsorships within their organizations. And these are the kind of things that Respect Outside helps organizations implement. So if this information is of interest to you, then you definitely want to keep your eye on the Supreme Court. We are awaiting a decision in the case that at the Supreme Court, which has challenged whether sexual orientation or and gender identity are protected under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 60, 1964. This is the federal law used by the EEOC to fight workplace discrimination. In this decision, the Supreme Court will decide what it means to discriminate on the basis of sex. Almost half of the states in the United States recognize sexual orientation and gender identity as sex, thus providing protections under state law. But the rest of the states don't provide protection under state law. Usually, LGBTQ folks in these hostile states would rely on federal law to seek protection. But the Supreme Court case may deny protections under federal law in these cases. Given the conservative makeup of the court, many fear a very narrow definition of sex will leave the LGBTQ community unprotected by both state and federal law. Now, this is obviously a complicated issue, but regardless of what happens at the Supreme Court, equity work will continue. It has to. It's the best and right thing to do. But it also makes business sense. A recent McKinsey study showed that companies who had culturally and ethnically diverse executive committees and executive teams were 33% more likely to have better than average profits. So it pays to be diverse. As I've mentioned, Respect Outside helps companies create a comprehensive policy and procedures around sexual harassment. And part of this work is to help companies understand that not all victims are the same. Companies need to create their sexual harassment policies to offer a myriad of ways for folks to respond, report, and cope 
with workplace harassment. No two victims are the same. It's essential that organizations recognize that people of color, men, and LGBTQ community employees may need a different approach in responding and reporting workplace harassment. In our industry, creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce is going to take significant effort, as many of us in this room know. We come to this industry with shared values, shared values for outdoor spaces, sustainability, and the climate crisis. Collectively, we've done a great job in outdoor stewardship, teaching outdoor ethics, respect for the environment, to leave no trace. But now it's time for us to bring all the aspects of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion under this big and burgeoning sustainability tent. That's where it belongs, and how it affects workplaces in the outdoor industry, and that's where everyone should be together in this work industry. Many of y'all have been doing this work for a long time. You've been, but we all know it will take a coalition, and Respect Outside is really happy to be on this journey with you. Jim and I will be at the front table back there after this if y'all have questions for us or the work we do, and we have some information there as well. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gina. That was really, really inspiring. And thank you for bringing up the, the climate issue as well. And so, yeah, I think I really appreciate that fresh look at, um, at diversity and inclusion uh, through the lens of uh, climate and of sustainability. That's, that's a real takeaway to me. Um, we're moving on to uh, feature our, one of our founders here at the Inclusivity Luncheon, James Edward Mills. Many of you know him. Many of you love him. He is, many of you might not, but uh, no, but that means you don't really know him. But um, so James wrote a book a few years ago called The Adventure Gap, 2017? 2014. Really? Damn it, I feel old again. Um, yeah, so his book was uh, really one of the first uh, actual treatises out from the industry perspective out to the world about a, a particular event, uh, a climb on McKinley, that he'll tell you a little bit about, but really the, the question to James that he's gonna attempt to answer here is like, well, where have we come since then? You know, that was five, six years ago. Um, maybe we can get an update from James on the adventure gap. And um, I know we're running a little bit behind, so I wanted to add just a couple things. There is more food coming. Um, I know it, it emptied out pretty quick. And um, let's see, also I missed giving the land acknowledgement. So we're here on uh, Rapaho land also Cherokee, I believe. And so I just wanted to make sure to get the old uh, you as well. All right, thank you for that. And so I um, wanted to make sure we covered that. And then I'll speak a little bit more after James on another thing happening tomorrow. So take it away. Thank you. Yeah. That's uh, luckily, yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much for having me today. And, and I, I got to tell you, uh, Teresa Baker gave me a hard time last night. She she says that I've been doing this work longer than she's been alive. Um, that's not true. It's not nice. It's not nice. But the, the reality is that not unlike Kenji, I've been attending outdoor retailer as an event um, for a very long time. I've actually started my career in uh, 1989, um, but I've been attending this show since 1992. And um, when I uh, began my career, uh, much of what um, we're experiencing now was kind of just in its very much fledgling, fledgling stages. And uh, the book that I created, The Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors, is basically the upshot of the last uh, 25 years of my career, um, which, like many of you, started, frankly, when I was a kid. Um, I've been engaged and involved in the outdoor um, as, as a participant from a very, very early age. Um, and after um, an experience in, in uh, college, um, being able to 
exercise my personal interest and passion for the outdoors. I really had many opportunities to spend time in nature. I'm here with my uh, very best friend, uh, John Mayer. Uh, the year we graduated from college in 1988, um, hiking to uh, the Grand Canyon for the first time. Uh, directly after college, um, working for uh, the campus outing club, and this is not. I'm being happy. Oops. Yeah. It's... Actually, um, working for the, the Campus Outing Club at the University of California, Berkeley, where um, I got a degree in anthropology and spent the very first uh, year of my career in the industry working as a climbing instructor in Yosemite. Um, directly after that, um, actually, why don't I have you advance the slides yeah, for me? Yeah. Um, and um, being able to spend time with, with friends in the outdoors and in this photograph, being able to uh, do an ascent of Mount Whitney at the, t at the, low, the highest peak in the lower 48. Um, but also being able to go on to have a career in the outdoor industry. And this is really where my story here begins. Um, this photograph was taken my very first season as um, the first African-American sales representative for a little company you might have heard of called the North Face. Mm -hmm. And um, this was our, our sales force at the time, and I was one of 12 uh, full-time professional independent sales representatives for the North Face. Um, and it, as it happens, I was actually hired the same year that they hired the first woman to be um, the uh, to be an independent sales rep. And this is in 1992. Um, and from there, I actually had the experience being able to travel around the country, um, but specifically in the Midwest Territory, as an independent sales rep. And much of my job was to be the face of the North Face in six Midwestern states that I lovingly refer to as Louisiana Purchase. Because it basically <laughs> represents Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, North and South Dakota, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And me and my dog, Jenga, traveled that territory 35,000 miles a year um, and um, had a fabulous time uh, telling the story of outdoor recreation. And I was quite literally the face of this brand at the time. But one of the things that I realized was that there seemed to be a divide between who spends time in nature and who doesn't. Because many of the things that you probably recognize in all these photographs is that that was typically, if not exclusively, the only person of color. And something really kind of hit me that um, our industry did not reflect the racial and cultural diversity of our country. And attending an event like Outdoor Retailer from, a, from 25 years ago, I was quite literally one of maybe 10 to 15 people of color in the entire building back when we were in Reno, also at the Salt Palace. And when we started talking about this, I started doing some research and came up with some interesting statistics. For example, uh, currently the African American population represents 13% of the population as, as a whole. But they actually only uh, represent less than 2% of national park visitors. Now, if you take a look demographically at where we are from the year 2000 to 2014, national, the African, the national nation's black population grew 35% faster than the population as a whole. Um, and by the year 2060, uh, we're estimated to go from 4.5 million to 7.5 million, making up 17.9% of the total population. So what happens if, as these numbers are increasing, our participation in the national parks and other wild and scenic places doesn't increase with it? And ultimately, I think that creates a problem, not just in terms of the industry of outdoor recreation, but the long-term preservation of our um, wild and scenic places. Because if we take a look at the demographic reality, it's estimated, but estimated by the year 2045, fully half of the US population will be non-white. And if we don't keep pace with these statistics, ultimately we will have a majority of the population with limited affiliate, uh, uh, um, affinity for the outdoors. Because um, when we take a look at what that ultimately means, um, the, when minorities basically become the majority, um, what happens when we fail to engage a new emerging population of youth that will be the engine of the future? So it's at that point I think that it's very important as we're moving upon all of us in this room to directly um, engage a new generation of young people who can become part of, of the, uh, the outdoor industry. Because we have a long history of the, um, of the protection and preservation of our wild and scenic places. Some of you might recognize this photograph from my book. This is Charles Madison Crenshaw. And in 1964, he became the first African American to summit the highest peak in North America, a mountain then called Mount McKinley, now called Denali. 
And what's especially interesting about Crenshaw is um, he actually did that seven days after the signing of the Civil Rights Amendment. And oddly enough, if you take a look at Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, he quite literally outlines outdoor recreation as part of his vision to ascend to mountains. The last paragraph reads, um, let freedom ring from every mountainside, from the curvaceous slopes of California to the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. But at the time, there were places in this country where Charles Crenshaw couldn't live, he couldn't vote, he couldn't exercise his rights as an American citizen. But as mountains do, they don't discriminate. So I think we have an excellent opportunity to be able to share the important work of, of, of racial and uh, cultural integration and also uh, diversity and inclusion through the work that we do um, in the outdoors. Um, in, in, in 2013, when we put together the first all African American team ascent of Denali, we actually put together a coalition of, of, of athletes that are reflective of an emerging population so that we now have solid visual representation of what mountaineers can look like. So hopefully, as we engage this new generation of young people, they will see people who look uh, more like themselves. Um, so much so that um, in 2018, um, Outdoor Afro successfully put the first team of all African American climbers in the summit of Kilimanjaro. That included one of our athletes from Expedition College, um, the youngest female member of our team, Rosemary Saul. Um, actually did something that no one had ever done before. And that was because of the support and encouragement that she received from people in this room and from the work that we've um, successfully done to make our industry more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So much so that when you, when you go to outdoor retailer today, it looks a little bit more like this. And as we talk, talk about what it means to make our industry more inclusive, we can ultimately hopefully introduce more people into the sports that we love. Um, and I want to make sure that when we get into the outside, we can see ourselves as part of it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, James. Very inspiring and uh, a great story told quickly. So thanks for that. Um, there's a lot of work that went into that. That was really like super clip notes. But thanks for uh, sharing that with us. And um, more to come from Mr. Uh, James Mills. Uh, just real quick, tomorrow there is a, we, we talked a little bit about justice and about climate. Like these are things that are rising in our industry um, and they're, they're connecting with our sort of industry meets conservation platform that a lot of us have known about for a long time and that has attracted us to work in this industry to begin with. We're not just an industry looking for uh, favors in policy and support we're an industry looking to create access for all and to uh, create a, a social justice platform that allows all people to get into the spaces, to get into the wild, to achieve a healthy recreation outcome. <coughs> Tomorrow there's a climate, um, there's a climate uh, march. It's at 1.30, starting at the Bear, I think. Is that right? Anyone know about that? Starts at the Bear. Yeah. So, 1.30. I just wanted to help promote that. Um, Carolyn Gleick, my friend, and uh, the lovely Katie Bouet will be, has been leading that, and so uh, for those that can make it, um, heads up. All right, uh, we're gonna move on, and uh, we're gonna take, um, we're gonna hear from REI, one of the most, really the most, uh, what's the word, persistent uh, companies focused on inclusion in the industry, uh, if not by far the most uh, down the path. So, uh, Ladon, are you you're here? Yes. Hi. Take it away, Ladon. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you so much, Kenji, for inviting us. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. Ooh, that light is bright. Um, it's, I, I just uh, have to start by saying it's a, a true honor and privilege to be in a room with so many people who are doing and have been doing this kind of work for so long. Um, so thank you for including us, and um, my name is Ladon Yaldadeh, and I've, um, I'm the manager for a particular project that REI is supporting um, that is a part of a larger, much larger body of work. Um, the project itself is called Race and Place, and I'll get a little bit more into it. 
Um, I wanted to pick up on something that you said, James, um, in terms of thank you so much for just breaking down the demographics and how this country by 2045 will be majority non-white. Um, and uh, it's so important to include the voices and the representations of these communities in the conversation. I myself, I'm Iranian American. I was an immigrant here. I immigrated here in six, when I was 16. And you can imagine the representations of an Iranian in um, a current day America. So I have a personal connection to this work. Um, and uh, what, what we discovered was that majority of diverse communities ultimately don't feel safe or welcome in the outdoors for many, many reasons, many of which you are already familiar with, so we won't get too much, too deeply into that. Um, however, what we realized was that the outdoor industry players, if you will, including REI, some of the large industry um, movers and shakers, uh, were not necessarily for a very long time helping um, the situation. And part of it is because, you know, for example, REI was started by a white couple and they pretty much recruited their friends. And so it just was the cultural norms of, of um, them and their friends. And, and many of the outdoor industry was um, basically um, sort of following the same suit. However, when we started to really look at how we could change um, the norms, what we realized was that there was both internal work that we had to do at REI, and this is long before my arrival at REI, um, as well as really the work that we were doing customer facing. And um, this is, I just wanted to share this slide because this is really our North Star here with our For All agenda, which is the DEI work that REI is committed to. And it starts with the belief that REI, we believe that a life outdoors is a life well lived. And that is true for all. And so um, what we discovered was that we had to very systematically and strategically address all of the different um, stream, you know, work streams that we had at REI um, in order to really be able to then speak to our um, commitment to the DEI work um, when it came to the, our customers. So my brilliant colleague here, um, Nicole Browning, can tell you all about this. This is her creation, and, and she is totally from top down um, in the weeds with it. So, uh, so we can, you know, um, hit Nicole up uh, later about this slide. Um, however, um, this is sort of like a manifestation, just a little bit of a taste um, and a manifestation of what REI's been customer facing. Um, projects have been. We support a plethora of nonprofit partners, some of whom are here, and I'll do a shout out in just a moment um, uh, by uh, supporting them both <clears throat> financially and also in kind. But also, we also we internally have launched major, major campaigns. For example, Force of Nature, which many of you are familiar from a few years back, where all of REI's efforts um, was put in that direction of really highlighting women in the outdoors. Um, to supporting LGBTQ events, and we have a large storytelling channel um, called Co-op Co uh, Co Journal. And through that channel, we tell a lot of stories, and many of those stories have also been covering the DEI. Um, so, Race in Place. This project in earnest started in 2017 um, in two phases. Uh, and it kind of worked in reverse, actually. What we wanted to do was um, to really address um, in two ways the idea of communities of color and how they were reclaiming and redefining the outdoors. Um, what we realized was that um, REI didn't necessarily have the expertise. So um, we... Uh, worked with The Atlantic and basically asked some of our greatest partners, um, which, Kinji, uh, if you can forward that slide, that'd be great, which is on, um, on the next slide. Thank you. Um, these are our partners that we basically brought together as a think tank, and we all began to ask the question of what was the barrier to entry for communities of color and diverse communities? So these are some of the faces you'll recognize. Um, I just saw our dear, dear friend and current advisory board member, Jose Gonzalez here. Um, Jose, are you in the room? Yeah, Jose. Yeah. Um, and I also ran into Len Nessifer a little bit earlier. And so, 
Oh, great. Um, and Perry's here. Are you guys here? Oh, great. Um, so we brought people from a very, very sort of diverse um, connection to the outdoors, right? Some of them were academics, some of them were government officials, people who just love the outdoors, people who were founders of affinity groups in the outdoors. And we, um, we encouraged them to ask the question of what was the barrier to entry for folks. And um, they identified some of those and also then put together a very, very pragmatic, wonderful set of action steps, if you will. Um, and if you just Google REI and The Atlantic, it was published in 2018, it's still online, and you will see the full, um, full results of that project. So, um, we can advance, thank you. So that basically led us to what ultimately is the most powerful medium we have, which is the medium of storytelling. My background is in film, I'm a producer, but I'm also a um, socially engaged artist for many, many years. So I've worked with many diverse communities to bring together their stories in different forms. And part of what we wanted to do was um, to bring together a diverse group of folks at very specific locations through long discussions and guidance by our advisory board, Kenji, if you don't Thank you. Um, uh, so this advisory board, some of whom had carried on from the Atlantic project, we basically um, took their lead in a year-long process of really talking about what regions to focus on, what were some of the topics at hand, and really following their guidance. Um, and s some of them are remaining as our partners as the project comes into fruition, hopefully later in the fall. So, um, and again, some of the you know folks that were working on it before. And what we decided was that we were going to have what we're calling trail chats. So there will be people, again, from a very diverse background in terms of um, their professions, their race, ethnicity, gender, all you know, all of that. Um, and at, but that they would be um, stakeholders within each one of these locations who could talk about their connection to the land and really discuss the location in a very complex and nuanced way. Um, one of the things that we are discovering, again, with the guidance of our advisory board, is that there is a lot of complexity to these stories, that many of us have connections to the land that sometimes overlap and sometimes actually can appear to be in conflict with one another. But that what's important is for us to really Show, um, show that we can all be in conversation with one another, even if we are sometimes seeing um, things not completely eye to eye. And this is part of what's so exciting about this project is that bridging, you know, or, or kind of dissolving this thing that's happening in this country in terms of us versus them and, and this very sort of, you know, divided country that we're living in. Anyway, so um, we worked with our, you know, luminaries um, and our advisory council. We have four places. Um, the participants will be invited to come to literally what is called the trail chat. So we will have outside locations where we take a stroll down the trail or go to some um, key locations and have a conversation, informal conversation, um, that's uh, you know about this location and all the different topics that might come up in terms of the significance of it. Um, so, no, that's perfect, thank you. The four locations that the advisory board, or, um, advisory board um, deemed as good places to start, and again, this is a starting point, is the Tule Lake National Monument um, in California, the site of the largest internment, Japanese-American internment concentration camp in the country, um, but also a, a native land to the Modoc um, tribe of Oklahoma who were displaced in the 1800s when they lost the war there, to current local farmers, and it's an economically depressed region in the very, very northern border of um, California, and a very significant one because it's actually a, 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 the largest bird migration path um, in the United States. So many, many stakeholders and many, many interesting topics to discuss. 
Um, the second location is the border region of El Paso and Juarez, and this region was selected because we wanted to showcase how one community on two sides of the border had a very symbiotic and fluid um, uh, community, and um, there is a 10K race that happens there sponsored by the El Paso Community Foundation, and we're very excited to showcase that. Um, the third region was the African Meeting House in Boston, and what's really unique is that that's the um, oldest, as many of you know, um, black church north of the Mason-Dixon line, and it was an absolute hub for folks who went through the Freedom Trail and finally made it to the north, and then of course there was no support or there was no spaces for them to really be uh, free and among one another. So. Um, and what's unique about this is that it's actually an urban trail that we're covering, and that's one of the things that REI is um, also discovering, is that we kind of need to redefine what we mean by the outdoors, that not everybody is, is a mountain climber, and not everybody is a, um, you know, an adventure sports person and can travel 100 miles from their home to go get outside. That maybe the nearby park might be their version of the outdoors, or an urban trail in the neighborhood. Um, and then the last one is Bears Ears National Monument, um, which for many of us, you know, it's very significant what's happened in the last few years. But what's also significant, and again with the really good guidance of our board and Len, um, is, is to really kind of focus on the coalitions that have developed there between not just the sovereign nations, um, the tribal nations there, but also between the nations and, and the climbing community and how it's expanded the understanding and the um, respect of both communities that have typically been at um, odds with each other. Oh, well, I just asked you. <laughs> So just very quickly, thank you so much for coming. I think that probably this slide that I skipped is that, you know, hoping, it's really, this is a multidisciplinary project that we are, uh, you know, um, inviting artists and uh, storytellers and essayists and journalists. And um, so hopefully it will be multidimensional and um, it's, uh, here are some examples, um, and one of the inspirations that Nicole and I continue to go back to is the 1619 project because of its breadth and how contemporary and cohesive and beautifully put together it was. So um, that's sort of, uh, you know, and, and here are some other examples um, of it. So um, stay tuned, and um, if you have questions, I'm definitely available after. The... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Thank you, Leon. All right, moving right along. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I know we're running a little bit late. Um, we are turning the mic over to last but not least to Joe Bryant the second. Joe works in diversity and inclusion with VF Corporation, and so uh, I'm going to hand it right over to Joe and go out with it. No, I don't get an applause. That's awesome. <laughs> Just about to sit up here and say this is always a uh, room where I feel the most at home. And y'all just gonna not clap. Me. <laughs> um, first thing, I'm really, really focused on love right now you know, with, with everything going on. Uh, first things first. Um, thank you to Kenji uh, for putting this together. Um, Second thing, second, thank you to all the, the other speakers um, who shared some really exciting things. Third thing, third, today's my dad's birthday, so can I get a really quick yeah. happy birthday? Yeah. My dad. Yeah. And the reason that that is important, he's a Southern Baptist preacher, and my promise to him is that I will not be up here as long as he's on the pulpit on Sunday. So I'll, I'll be concise. Um, I, I really just wanted to spend my time talking about really two words as I was sitting there in the audience. And that's reflection and perseverance. I think back to a year ago with where VF was in our journey. Um, a lot of transition in the process of relocating several individuals and their families to the, to the Colorado Rockies, um, in the process of relocating the, the world headquarters, in the process of relocating um, several brands. Um, and I reflect back to where we were at that time and, and to now be in our temporary space in Greenwood Village, to be 
transitioning down to downtown here later this year. Um, it really, it really gets me excited about really the perseverance of our associates and the perseverance of our teams. But one thing that has remained throughout that time of transition is our commitment to inclusion and diversity. And, and really for us, the reason I'm excited is to talk to you all a little bit about what inclusion means to us. For us, we really wanna make sure that whether you're a consumer, whether you're a candidate in the talent pipeline, whether you're an associate in our stores, in our, in our supply chain environments, or in our corporate environments, that you can feel valued, supported, or championed. Um, and make sure that you have an opportunity to develop your career and own your career um, in an equitable ecosystem that, that creates that opportunity for you. So I wanted to share four things that we're doing um, in Q4, which for us is January, February, and March, to really give you all a little uh, insight into some of the work that we've been doing. The first is our, our Jonestown dis, uh, Distribution Center talent strategy. We understood um, as we've really thought about making sure that our conversation around inclusion is more than gender and more than people of color. We looked at uh, people with disabilities in that community and the lack of opportunities that they have has had historically as it relates to work, um, whereas their desire to work has always been high. Um, so again, 18 months ago, our leader, uh, Reggie Miller, along with the supply chain executive, traveled to a Walgreens distribution center in South Carolina to understand what they have been doing over the, the past 15 years in creating an, an environment and a process for people with disabilities to come in and begin working into their factories. Um, so for us, we started to do that. And, and we launched our uh, talent strategy again, Perseverance, 18 months ago. Our East Coast Distribution Center came online last January. Um, and I'm excited to say that next month in February, we'll be launching our Inclusions Talent Strategy where we will be welcoming in a cohort of four to six people with disabilities. Um, we redesigned the, uh, the distribution center to create a test lab for those individuals to spend eight weeks practicing and learning in a controlled environment what their jobs will actually be when they get on the floor. Um, so again, that will be in Jonestown, um, Pennsylvania, and we're really excited about adding that, that component um, of people with disabilities to our global disability strategy. The second thing I want to talk about is our Employee Resource Group Leadership Summit. I see some people in here um, who will be participating in that, and I'm really excited for that. We have over 40 Employee Resource Group leaders coming from um, all around the world uh, to, to the Denver area to learn about what ERGs will need to be for the company moving forward. But the reason I get excited about this is because of those three words. I'm not sure you can see it. Education, experience, and exposure. We want to make sure that the leaders who are putting in this work uh, to champion inclusion and diversity within our brands and our campus locations um, get this opportunity and access with our senior leaders. So we're starting with a welcome reception with our CEO to really talk about the importance of ERGs to the company. Um, we'll, we'll start the afternoon of day two really understanding the new governance and really the structure and, and really support that our team will provide them so they can continue to champion inclusion and diversity um, around our four C's, career, commerce, community, and culture. Uh, the reason I'm excited about the Leadership Summit is because we've really embedded our executive sponsors into that process. Each of our executive sponsors will be talking about a different topic that most people don't get an opportunity to, to talk about in a structured environment. Things like strategy. Right? What's the where to play, how to win, and how can you embed this into your ERG strategy for the following fiscal year? Things like influence, the importance of listening and understanding your, your stakeholders so that you can uh, accomplish a team goal. Things like business acumen, understanding the importance of managing a P&L and how understanding that financial component can accelerate your career. Um, and then the thing that I get most excited about is our uh, executive speed networking. We'll have uh, members of our executive leadership team and vice presidents sit down with our leaders for about 15 minutes each um, in a group setting and rotate and talk about things like, what are you most passionate about? What's been your biggest career accomplishment? And, and that really goes back to the word of access, right, to me. So we're really excited about that. And then we'll spend the third day really talking about your fiscal 21 action plans and how you can leverage this, um, the things that you've learned to accelerate that. Um, we'll also have a keynote speaker um, and do a, a best practices panel as well. 
February uh, starts on Saturday, so we're really excited for Black History Month and, of course, International Women's Day. Say that again. <laughs> International Women's Day and Women's History Month will be right around the corner. And we're excited because we have multiple activations that are led by our brands um, throughout the Americas. Uh, three of our movement territories, we have three, they're Outside Matters, Worthy Works, and Free to Be. And so we've been excited to see how we've been able to embed those territories into the themes of our work. So here, and I love what James said about the adventure gap, because here in Denver, um, in collaboration with our multicultural employee resource group, Ace Diversity, we're actually going to be hosting a panel entitled Celebrating Being Black, Being Black in the Outdoors, um, where we're inviting Dr. Ray Wynn Grant, who's uh, a con con conservation scientist and wildlife ecologist, Ecologist, I, I practiced that at home and I thought it would go smoothly. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ray Wynn Grant, um, Fred Campbell, who's a TNF climber, and uh, Kim um, Bentley, who's a part of the National Brotherhood of Skiers, really talking to us about how did you fall in love with the outdoors? What are some of those adventure gap barriers that James mentioned? Um, and how can we continue to create access, right, for those African Americans and black people um, within this, uh, who want to explore the outdoors? So we're really excited about that. Our Vans brand is rooted in youth culture and creative expression. Um, and so what they elect to do is they're sponsoring an art contest for K through 12 students with the Orange County Heritage Council um, on the theme of what does African American excellence look like to you? Um, so that actually starts on February 1st, which is a Saturday. Um, and not only will the winners of that contest get a chance to come on campus um, and tour the Vans facility, but we'll be hanging their artwork um, in, the, in the Vans headquarters as well. I'm like, the microphone's down here. Um, and lastly, with, with Dickies, they're really focused on worthy work. Um, and so the National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum and Hall of Fame is actually in Fort Worth, where Dickies is headquartered. So we've invited their executive director to the campus to talk a little bit more about the Buffalo Soldiers and their journey and their contribution to American history as we began to explore the West. Um, and she will also be talking about one of our guiding principles of being curious, and how we can continue to get students into the museums. So that's our Black History Month activation. Um, for women, International Women's Day, we're gonna be doing a global webcast uh, featuring several brand athletes uh, under the concept of not just one thing. And really talking about intersectionality of those women, um, their gender, their sexuality, but then also their experience within their sport and how they've had to compete and overcome different adversity. And last but not least, I wanted to just share a little bit about our action planning process. Um, we're in that process right now. For us, we, we really consider inclusion diversity a cross, co cross collaboration between our business leaders and our HR business partners to ensure that we have equitable career opportunities, to ensure that we're creating a culture of workplace inclusion, and to make sure that we're leading with innovation um, for the consumer of the future, um, as several people mentioned. And so for us, we're in the process of collaborating with our talent acquisition partners, our talent development partners, and of course our HR business partners to understand what their brand or corporate functions vision is for fiscal 21, which for us starts in April, um, and then embedding inclusion and diversity into that. Um, we'll go through the process of presenting that to our business leaders in March, um, and then we'll put a button on it um, and present that to our senior leadership. And our leaders are held accountable to what they're able to accomplish. Um, so really just wanted to, again, circle it back to reflection. Um, Kenji started this conversation reflecting on where we were five years ago. I think back to my first OR, OR a year ago um, and to see faces, familiar faces, and beginning to learn names and recognize people. That's an important feeling, um, which really is where VF is focused in the future um, on that sense of belonging, right? Not just being included, not just being diverse, but how can we make sure that people belong? So again, thank you so much for your time, um, and I hope you all enjoyed this. That was great. Well done, Joe, thank you. Um, all right, I know it's running late, and um, some of you might need to start rolling, but before you go, just a couple comments, and don't forget, as you're leaving, maybe walk with someone you haven't met, or um, get to know each other, because this community, this rising community and movement, in outdoor uh, only gets stronger as as you all connect. So to that end, um, you know, you've seen some amazing things, you've heard some stories from around the industry, um, but really the question is on you, what, what next? What can you do? What can I do 
as an individual? What can I do as my organization uh, lead or a board member or an employee? Um, so I just want to have you lead with that question, but maybe offer something up from a small business person uh, perspective that I'm going away with. And one is, uh, one idea is to join up with more organizations that are part of this movement. So, um, you know, I, Ibaki and I started a little page called Everybody Out, Everybody Outside. So, that, you know, to follow that and see what kind of things bubble up from inside and outside the industry. There's Diversify Outdoors. There's the Outdoor CEO Pledge. If you go to Diversify Outdoors and look it up, you will see what that's about, and you'll learn about Teresa Baker a little bit. Um, there are other places where we convene online, and hopefully what we're trying to do with this event and with uh, in between is to find a place to keep the drumbeat going faster because we're trying to quicken the pace of this movement. And so we're looking for that home. You know, Camber is another place where there's going to be a lot of activity. And, um, you know, I want to put Emily on the spot, but um, we want to be able to post up these um, concepts for organizations to take on and make their own. Um, so that's one thing, is to, is to join up, be part of the, uh, the movement in whatever uh, way makes sense for you. Uh, and then also calendarize was something I took away from Joe's presentation, was uh, there are touch points, and all of us who run retail stores, have been in the business, you know, we have to, we have a calendar, and this is, you know, this is North Face month, or, you know, back to the trail month, or whatever month it is in your shop or relative, relevant to your business or organization, Calendarize these events. You know, there is International Women's Day. There is Black History Month. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, biracial Japanese month, but you know, maybe we'll get one, uh, and I'll be all over that. But, um, but that's a, another thing to do is is plan is put the plan. That's the action plan. These are things any company, any industry, or uh, I'm sorry, any uh, organization or individual can do. So um, I think the feeling of like, ah, oh, we're stuck, or you know, uh, I'm, I don't know what to do. I think that there's small steps that, in aggregate, we can all take to uh, to advance this thing. So with that, I, I leave you to it. Thank you for your patience and letting us go a little long. And um, I've got all your contact info, so I'll be back in touch with some follow-up about where to go next and where we might start to drum, beat this drum more frequently. So thank you.